strange that they don't teach money at school. What they teach us to do is get a job, be an employee. I don't want to do that. The rich don't pay taxes legally because the government wants us to do certain things. They're incentives. They tax the stupid, the uneducated, the misinformed. So I'm using debt to get richer. Most people use debt to get poor. Entrepreneurs rise from anywhere. Poverty doesn't need to be explained. Right. Really what needs to be explained is our wealth, our yeah. prosperity. How, where did that come from? And how do we get more of that? How do we generate more of that for everybody globally? What companies do you admire? Great, let's buy those companies in our portfolios. Mm -hmm. Let's not worry about what the market's gonna do tomorrow. Let's right. not worry about people telling you it's gonna crash next year, those kinds of things. Think about being an investor for the rest of your life, 40 plus years, and let's start doing it the real way, the way that works. vibrating with excitement. Our purpose in this project is something that is extraordinary in its scope because financial illiteracy is so rampant within our culture. Money is such an important topic, but yet people want to try to avoid this topic and through grade school, high school, college, even grad school, the idea of getting financially literate never occurs to people in a meaningful way. So this project is something near and dear to my heart because I know it's going to change a lot of people's lives and I want it to change your life. We really span the globe for this project and many of the names of the experts that we interviewed will be known to you. Some of them will not, but once you see their interviews, you're going to know them very, very well. With all of these interviews, and interactions. There are three areas that we focused on. Number one, how to create wealth. Number two, how to protect it. And number three, how to grow it. What was fascinating to me are the different perspectives on this. So I know that different things are going to have different levels of impact on you. I encourage you to watch the entire series. Don't just cherry pick certain interviews, but watch everything because you need a 360 degree view of this topic called money and understanding those three key areas again, which are how to create wealth, how to preserve your wealth or protect it, and then how to grow your wealth. So with all that being said, let me enthusiastically invite you to watch episode one of Money Revealed. out that we had an interview set up with Robert Kiyosaki. I was over the moon excited and had a huge amount of anticipation. But here's what I didn't anticipate, that the actual interview would blow away any expectations that I had. This is an interview that I am going to be watching over and over again for years to come. And I'm extraordinarily privileged and excited to share it with you right now. Robert, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, so thanks for being here. Hey, thank you. I'm excited too. <laughs> I feel like there's, we could talk for days about so many things, uh, you know, as far as the, the wisdom that you've generated over the years relative to money and investment and uh, what's wrong with the system and you know, how, to, how to change your, your perspective of it. But how did you even get started here in the first place? What, you know, what got you interested in, in this line of work that you do? What line of work am I in? <laughs> well, you're in a couple of lines of work. As I see, you're, I think you're a money philosopher. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. You're so an I'm entrepreneur. Have, I, have, yeah. I have multiple businesses. And so. Uh, so what got you started on the road to being an entrepreneur? I just didn't want a job. I mean, it's, uh, I just didn't want a job. You know, every time my school teacher says, if you don't get good grades, you won't get a job. I said, good, I'm on the right track because <laughs> I never had good grades. And that drives a lot of people crazy because they, you know, education is very important. Mm -hmm. But for me, going to school was a waste of time because I had a rich dad and I had a poor dad. And my poor dad was the head of education. Mm -hmm. And he was poor because he was in education. 
And so I knew my dad was a PhD, you know, mm -hmm. from Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern, head of education for the state of Hawaii. And having him as a father, I realized that if he went to school, he'd probably never be rich. So at the age of nine, I raised my hand in the, I was in the fourth grade growing up in Hawaii, Hilo, Hawaii, a little sugar plantation town. Mm -hmm. And I asked my fourth grade teacher, I said, when will I learn about money? And she looked at me, you know, she got, she was like a church lady, <laughs> like Dana Carvey. And, oh, aren't we? You know, she goes, we don't teach money at school. So I asked her, so why am I in school then? <laughs> And I kept bugging her, and finally, I mean, and she was like 10 years over retirement, I think. And she got nastier and meaner at me, because I just, I was nine years old. My classmates were all rich, and I was poor. And I'm going, I just want to be rich. I don't want to go to school. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. I looked at her, I said, well, my, how come my classmates are rich? They're not evil, you know what I mean? <laughs> And the hypocrisy got to me, you know, how kids are at nine. Sure. And so I went home to my poor dad, the head of education, PhD, all that stuff. And I said, how come they don't teach us about money at school? And he says, because the government doesn't allow us to do that. And so at nine, I went, that's strange. Mm. Do, do you know what I mean? I just wanted, yeah. you know, kids will ask questions until they get their answer. Sure. And my dad, you know, for Japanese, was tall, six foot four, 250 pounds, you know, big man. And I said, you know, Dad, that's really strange that they don't teach money at school. I said, what do they teach us to do? He says, get a job, be an employee. Mm -hmm. But I said, isn't that to work for money? He goes, well, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want, to, I don't want a job, and I don't want to spend my life working for money. It's a slave to money. Mm -hmm. So finally, he said, well, why don't you ask your best, your classmate, you know, your best friend in school in the fourth grade, because his father's going to be a rich man someday. So how do you know that? He says, because Mike, my rich dad's son, is an entrepreneur. And I went, what's an entrepreneur? He says, somebody does need a job. <laughs> I said, I want that job. I don't want a job, you know, and, uh, and entrepreneurs create jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of got started, just by asking what my fourth grade teacher thought were stupid questions. And that changed the direction of my life. So at the age of nine, I began studying with my rich dad, a man who never went to school. Mm -hmm. His father died when he was 13, so he took over the family business. And in retrospect, what made him smart, his teachers were his accountants, his attorneys, his bankers, mm -hmm. his real estate agents, because he was 13 years old. And he had real teachers. I mean, what I mean by a real teacher is somebody who's actually doing the real thing in real life. Mm -hmm. And as you know, most school teachers don't do the real thing that they teach. Right. And by the time I got to the college, I went to an academy, and I was flunking out of school for calculus, third, three, year, three years of calculus, and I couldn't do a damn thing. Mm -hmm. And I asked my calculus teacher, I said, when are we gonna learn about, you know, why am I, why am I studying calculus? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, do you ever use calculus? He goes, no. I said, why do you teach it? Because I get paid to. And, I, and I'm, I'm a child of the 60s. Mm. If I flunked out of calculus, it was nonstop to Vietnam. Right. Do you know what I mean? So oh, yeah. I had an incentive yeah. to pass calculus, right. which I flunked anyway. <laughs> but anyway, that's where I kind of got disillusioned with school, education. Education is important. But my poor dad was a poor man, although a PhD, mm. because they don't learn anything about money and they don't teach anything about money in school. And so we wonder why today we have a rise in socialism and communism and fascism and the anger against the rich, you know, these, these young senators in Congress and they want to tax the rich and charge them 70% taxes and all this. And I'm going, why are they doing this? Well, it's because our schools don't teach us about money. And that's why I'm, I'm in this business. And it hasn't changed since you were in school. I mean, today it still seems to be the same. No, it was not gonna change. It's really, it's, it's, it's tragic. Mm -hmm. So when I asked people, I said, what does school teach you about money? You get this zzzz. Mm -hmm. And I said, does your teacher know anything about money? They go zzzz. <laughs> Do our political leaders know anything about money? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's this, 
like money is the root of all evil in many people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. But we all use money, that's the irony of it. Is there a relationship between the banking systems, I'd like you to comment on the <laughs> banking system and the educational system? Well, the banks run the world. It's called the Central Banks of America, you know, the Fed, mm -hmm. the uh, ECB, the European Central Bank, mm -hmm. the PBLC, People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan. We're really, capitalism is run by a central banking system. Mm -hmm. That's called communism also. <laughs> the government is, you know, communism is a centralized government, capitalism is centralized banking. And the more you step back, you look at the big picture, the ultra-rich control the central banks. Mm -hmm. For example, the Rothschild Corporation, I, let's say there's 50 central banks, the Rothschilds own about 48 of them. Wow. And so uh, you and I don't have a prayer because mm -hmm. money makes the world go round and the economy runs on money, like it or not. Mm -hmm. So that's why I became a student of money back in the 80s and I began looking at, my, my, I was a student of R. Buckminster Fuller, a guy who created the geodesic domes and all that. And he wrote a book called Grunge of Giants. Grunge stands for gross universal cash heist. It's how the ultra rich steal our wealth. And so when I read Grunge of Giants in 83, I understood what my rich dad was telling me. And so my rich dad, all what he read Rich Dad Poor Dad, it says the rich don't work for money because our money is toxic, our money is corrupt. Our financial system, or money, is designed to make the rich richer, but keep the poor middle class poorer. And that's why our schools don't teach us about money, because the school system works for the central banks also. So basically the schools are designed to create employees. workers, employees, an employee mindset. Correct. Which is, I guess, in a part, survival mindset. You know, you get a job just to provide for your To work family. for money. Yeah. And, but uh, you learn nothing about money. Right. Irony. Ironic, isn't it? it it's, uh, well, look what would happen if you enlightened them about money in school. They wouldn't get out and go work for the bankers. Nah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. You know. I don't know what would happen. Mm -hmm. But I think the house of cards is about to come down anyway because the corruption inside our banking system is at all-time highs. This has happened before in history. It's been going on for thousands of years mm -hmm. where the banking system, I'm not blaming bankers. I like my banker a lot because mm -hmm. he gives me money. But anyway... <laughs> The whole system was rigged by the banks, the golden rule. Mm -hmm. who, he who controls the gold can, makes the rules. And so I decided I'd rather be on the banker's side than the employee side. Mm -hmm. It's just a choice. Yeah, so when you came to that realization, then uh, real estate seems to be your central focus of, for your investment? Not really. Okay. okay. People think I'm a real estate guy. I am an entrepreneur. I have many, many different companies. Mm -hmm. You know, I create jobs. I don't have a job. Mm -hmm. I don't have an office. I'm not allowed into my own company. <laughs> <laughs> See, an entrepreneur is just a free person. That's all it is. You don't ever need money again. And uh, yet you, as you said, providing jobs yeah. and in, you get into these industries. So uh, maybe we talk about the varying activities, but can we start with real estate and talk about your views of real estate investment? Well, it's really a business model. You mm -hmm. know, everybody talks about the business. You know, I came and asked you about your business model. Because mm -hmm. every business, every entrepreneur has a different business model. Mm -hmm. So the model I follow was McDonald's. Mm -hmm. You know, Ray Kroc. If you read Rich Dad Poor Dad in there, my friend interviewed Ray Kroc. You know, he was in the MBA program at University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And Ray Kroc asked the class, the MBA class, he said, what business is McDonald's in? And everybody says, you're in hamburgers. And Ray laughed, he says, no. McDonald's is in the real estate business. And so, when you, and there was a book called, a movie called Founder. Yes. With, I think, Keaton Michael started Keaton. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in there, he spells it out. The only reason you create a business is to buy real estate. Now, people think, oh, you're a real estate guy. No, that's not true either. So my business, so I have, I have Rich Dad, let's say, mm -hmm. and I buy, probably half a billion dollars worth of real estate on one company. Mm -hmm. And the reason I can do that is because real estate is really about debt and taxes, which they never teach you in school. Mm -hmm. So you understand the more profits I make, let's say I make a million dollars in rich debt, I can lever up, I can borrow five million to buy a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm using debt to get richer. Most people use debt to get poor. Mm -hmm. But that takes financial education or literacy, whatever you want to call it. So I buy real estate, and because I have $5 million in real estate, I pay no taxes. So the real game is called debt and taxes. That's why if you're red, rich, dead, poor debt, the rich don't work for money. I don't have RAITs, I don't have ETFs, I don't have mutual funds, I don't have stocks, because I'm an entrepreneur. So how is it that debt, real estate debt, because a lot of people, you know, you, you hear them you know, just prattling about debt is bad, never have debt, you don't want to get into debt, you know, right. et cetera. You're advocating it and, and uh, for tax savings, um, I guess in part for tax savings. So how does that work? I, I didn't say tax savings, I said well, don't pay taxes. Oh, well, okay, so to eliminate taxes. Big difference. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so to, to, that drives people crazy. Yeah. How can you not pay taxes? Well, you have to understand tax law. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you speak to that? Yeah, tax laws are not about not paying taxes. Tax law is incentives. So the government, uh, the government wants you to do certain things. For example, if you donate to a church, mm -hmm. they'll give you a tax break. Mm -hmm. You donate your car to the Kidney Foundation, they'll give you a tax break, right? right? So if I buy real estate, give me a tax break. <laughs> Lovely stuff, because I'm providing housing. Mm -hmm. If I invest in oil wells, I get a tax break because the government wants energy. If I invest in food production, I get a tax break. And when I use, when I borrow $5 million mm -hmm. to buy a piece of property, I get a tax break because the government needs me to be in debt. You see, if there's no debt, the economy collapses. The reason, when they dropped the interest rates after that whole central bank, the Fed screw up, mm -hmm. they had to drop the interest rates so guys like me would borrow. Yeah. You know, if they didn't want me to borrow, they'd raise interest rates. Mm -hmm. So they want me to borrow. When I borrow money, I create money. Mm -hmm. See, so money is only created as debt. Bonds, as people don't understand, they don't teach this in school. Yeah. So the more I borrow, the happier the government gets because I'm actually putting money into the economy. So I borrow, let's say, five million. I buy a $5 million piece of property. Then the tax law allows me to appreciate it, depreciate it, depreciate it and amortize it, mm -hmm. zero taxes. I collect all the income from that property tax-free. That's and the game. Is there ever a, a day like in the future that that comes home the roost or is it it's something that you can perpetuate year over year over year? Yeah. yeah. But you've got to be smart. They'll never teach you this in school. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know her name, uh, Elizabeth Warren and mm -hmm. Kamala Harris and AOC, they're all saying, let's tax the rich. Mm -hmm. So if you're over $10 million income, they're gonna tax you 70%. Let me wake people up here. You're making $10 million a year, you're not paying any taxes. <laughs> because you can hire the best tax accountants and pet tax attorneys that the money can buy. So they never tax the rich. They, attack, they tax the stupid, the uneducated, the, mm -hmm. the misinformed. Mm -hmm. It's tragic, and that's why I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, the rich don't pay taxes legally because the government wants us to do certain things. They're incentives. So when I buy an apartment house, I'm providing housing. I get full tax breaks. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I drill for oil, I don't buy Standard Oil or Chevron or Exxon. If I, if I drill for oil, the day I drill for oil, I get a 70% tax break. The day I drill, day yeah. one. Yeah. Now, do they, does, does Exxon tell you that? No. Oh. Well, so yeah. <laughs> and, and it shows that these so-called political leaders don't understand the tax system themselves. No. They just think Trump that some... Trump does. Well, and I was wondering about this with Trump because obviously, you know, he didn't want to release his tax returns. Why should he? I, I, I agree. But they would probably show similar, saying, you know, he doesn't really pay any taxes because he's doing what he does in real estate and probably understands what you understand. It's always in the paper, but the people don't understand what he's saying. Yeah. There was this article in the New York Times who was after uh, Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner is another rich Jewish real estate tycoon family in New right. York City who married Ivanka Trump, you know, all that stuff. It's right. just families marrying families. <laughs> and Sounds like, a, like royalty way back when. Yeah. <laughs> Aristocracy. And, yeah. So, and so the New York Times, this is a few months ago, was attacking Jared Kushner because he paid no taxes. And they were painting him out to be a criminal. And all Jared says, I just follow the tax code. 
Let me say this again. The tax code is not about paying taxes. The tax code is a series of incentives. Say, if you donate to your church, we'll give you a tax break. Mm -hmm. you, you grow food, we'll give you a tax break. You produce water, we'll give you a tax break. You provide mm -hmm. oil, we'll give you a tax break. You provide real estate, we'll give you a tax break. So if you're paying taxes, you're not, doing, you're not helping the government. Right. It's, it's a different point of view, that's all I'm saying. I, I've always felt and maintained that taxes were more about controlling behavior than they were about it collecting is. revenue, right? It is. It's like saying, hey, if you don't do these things, you get punished. If yes. you do them, you get rewarded. Yes. Yeah. It's really that simple, isn't the it? Tax code, my accountant, Tom Wheelwright, the smartest guy I know, <laughs> he wrote a book called Tax-Free Wealth. It's a Rich Dad Advisor book. Mm -hmm. If you're sick and tired of paying taxes, get the book. It's called Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright, CPA. He's, my, he's the guy that guides me. Well, so, and this is, this is where I've always personally felt the pain. I've been an entrepreneur for decades now, generate a lot of income. And I, what I came to realize after a couple of decades of working nights, working weekends, launching businesses, doing startups, taking risks, doing all the things that entrepreneurs do, is that if you, if you do that and you make regular income doing it, um, by the time you pay taxes, live any kind of a reasonable lifestyle, put your kids through school, you can't accumulate any real wealth. No, it's impossible. Screwed. Taxes just deplete the, the ability to, to have wealth accumulation. And I'll give you even worse advice. Yeah. Worse, I, I hate to break the bad news to you. You know, so many young people, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, or I'm going to quit my job and become mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. The moment you quit your job and become an entrepreneur, you pay higher taxes. Yeah. You see, an entrepreneur will pay for, I mean, a, an employee will pay approximately 40%. This is all over the world. Uh, employees pay approximately 40% of their income in taxes. Mm -hmm. Small entrepreneurs pay 65%. You can't get ahead that no, way. No. So the Rich Dad, Rich Dad is a company. We educate people about, about, about the, the big business side, the McDonald's side. Mm -hmm. you know, as Ray Kroc said, my business is real estate. So when I come in here, I'm looking at all your equipment and all mm -hmm. this stuff. So this is depreciated at you know pretty good rates. Right. But if you want long term, not pay taxes, it's real estate. Well, you, so you're you're starting my story. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, be my rich dad for a minute. <laughs> and uh, so if if I'm a guy and I am that makes you know a pretty high above average income, um, has you pay uh, high above taxes. I too. pay a lot of taxes. Um, and and they'll uh, never tell you that in school. No, not at all. It, you know, it's always, well, you know, when you're making that kind of money, you, know, you can afford to pay more taxes. And I'm like, but why do I get punished for the more I produce, the more I'm punished, you know, which means that I can't produce as many jobs, I can't expand my business, I can't, you know, all those things. And if you take the people who you know, value create and punish them and take the people who don't create and reward them, you know, it doesn't take long to see where that might end. So I've, I've logically worked all that out, but I've said, but what is the pivot point? How do I now go from this and say, I, I have some income, and I'm, I think I'm speaking for a lot of people who are watching this, I have some income, I maybe even have some accumulated capital, but how do I now, what are my steps to saying, I want to move toward that rich dad mentality and find a way to eliminate my, t my tax burden and actually accumulate some wealth? Well, that's why I said education is really important, mm -hmm. but not the stuff they teach you in school. Mm -hmm. If you do what they tell you in school, like doctors and lawyers, they pay the highest tax rates around. Exactly. That's not that intelligent. And they're yeah. the A students. Yeah. The C and D students like me, we don't pay taxes, but we, we hire good accountants, good attorneys. Mm -hmm. And we do what the tax code wants us to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when the markets crashed in 2007, I thought I died and went to heaven because, you know, they were giving real estate away and the interest rates dropped. Mm -hmm. Holy mackerel. You know, I, I thought, thank you, Jesus, you know, like, uh, you've given me, so I borrowed $300 million, and I bought all this real estate they're giving away, and I depreciated it, I appreciated it, and, and uh, amortized it. Mm -hmm. So I made millions of paid no taxes on debt. Mm. I borrowed money. But that's what I'm trained to do. Yeah. I, I, I'm not trained as a lawyer, I'm not trained as an accountant, I'm not trained as a doctor, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but I did have a rich dad. He's a man who never went to school, but he was trained by his accountants, his attorneys, his bankers, and all that. Real teachers, yeah. not these fake teachers in college.
<laughs> to, you know, in, in part, if, you know, if you're not looking to become a professional that requires a certain educational process, do you think that uh, college education in, in, or quote unquote investing in tuition is, is probably not a good investment? It depends on what you want to become. You want to be a doctor, I, I, should, yeah. I should hope you go to med school. You, know? <laughs> you want to be a real estate at, um, broker, you got to go to school. Got to get that license. Mm -hmm. so the moment you have a license, you're in the tax bracket. There's a book I wrote called The Cash Flow Quadrant, mm -hmm. E, S, B, and the I. Mm -hmm. E's and S's go to school, B's and I's don't. So the richest guys on earth didn't finish school. Like B's are like Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. Jobs, Gates, uh, Branson. Mm -hmm. And the investors, like I like Warren Buffett and uh, Soros and all that, they don't pay taxes. And isn't it, you know, somebody brought this up in, in the series, <laughs> you know, because you have people like, uh, like Buffett who will say, oh, you know, uh, I, I, I should be taxed higher. And, you know, he's making these public proclamations uh, when he's already got all this accumulated wealth that he hasn't paid tax on. No, what he says is he pays more, his secretary, the secretary pays, pays more, more tax than him and I should be taxed higher. And if you believe that guy, I mean, I got Santa Claus for you. <laughs> he is, you know, he's a very smart man. Of course. But he comes across as this jolly old Saint Nick, you know, mm -hmm. and he's, but he's smart as a whip. <laughs> so, um, he doesn't send his kids to school either. Oh, I didn't know this. Yep. I guess he's got the education they Correct. need, right? I'm just trying to say something, you know, like our school system is part of the system. Mm -hmm. And that pumps out Harris, you know, Kamala Harris and Alexa or Ocasio. AOC, yeah. AOC, AOC yeah. And, you know, lives with Warren and mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. And they're hardcore communists. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with being a communist, you know. But I'm a hardcore capitalist. Mm -hmm. So we have enough room on this planet for both of us. Mm -hmm. But when you don't give a child, a student, the choice, and all Rich Dad, our Rich Dad company did was give people a choice. Say, so you want to be an employee or a specialist, like a doctor or a lawyer, go to school. You want to be rich, like a, you know, a, what do you call it, Zuckerberg or a Jobs, and be like a, a Buffett or a Soros, Rich Dad. Mm -hmm. We're the 5%, and that's all we cater to. <laughs> and we're not very popular with the school teachers. <laughs> You've got that right for sure. Correct. I, yeah, I've, uh, that's my poor dad. The good people. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm just saying these are your choices here, and freedom is about choice. But we're not given those choices in school. Well, you know what's interesting, because I think to me in the end, you know, because you talk about like you said, you know, your your dad, you know, skilled academic, right? And, Brilliant. And, and probably a beautiful soul and caring and et cetera. Yes. Has a purpose in life and wants to leave the world a better place. Uh, so the intentions are all proper, but there's also, I think, in that academic sec sector, this sort of disdain for the quote-unquote profiteers, the entrepreneurs. You know, entrepreneur it. was almost a bad word when I went to school. It's still a bad word. Yeah. So uh, t it starts to, I think, translate, at least for me, that this starts to become sort of this, this spiritual issue. Right, that, that I believe that you know, for the people who were indoctrinated in the system, get out and they're working and they're taxed and they're, you know, all these things go on, that I, I think it has some sort of uh, adverse impact on the human spirit. It's not just a monetary issue. Correct. You know, there's four different types of intelligences. Number one is mental, mm -hmm. and that's the academic type. Two is physical, those are the athletes. Mm -hmm. Three is the emotional, and four is spiritual. Mm -hmm. And they're all different intelligences. So the whole combination of those four makes up the human being. So for me, what gives me the advantage is emotional intelligence. See, most people come out of school so terrified of making mistakes. They go, oh, what if I fail? I said, well, if you're not failing, you're not learning. Oh, what if I fail? <laughs> yeah, in school, you make mistakes. You're stupid. You know, in school, I was very cooperative at test time, but that's called cheating. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everything is opposite. It's, it's like par we're like a parallel universe. E's and S's on one side, B's and I's on the other. And all the rich dead company does is, hey, look, you want to be E's and S's, go to school. You want to be on the right side, the B and, the, and, the B and I side, the big business, 500 employees or more. I have thousands of employees. Mm -hmm. I provide a lot of jobs, so I pay no taxes. I should get that. Right. You know, I don't like it when I see people struggling financially. I don't yeah. like this gap between the rich and everybody else. 
You know, I went past the 1% a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. In the 60s, with a child of a Vietnam era guy, I fought in Vietnam, a Marine, a pilot, you know, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I fought for capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really did. I sincerely believe that in the American dream. But we don't have financial education. But when I was in Vietnam, there wasn't much of a gap between rich, poor, and middle class. You know, the, the rich had nicer houses and newer cars. That's right. about it. Poor guys had junk, junk cars and junk houses. That's about it, though. Mm -hmm. And then it got to be that as capitalism took off and provided things. So today, the poor and middle class, they can afford to travel throughout the world, but they fly on Southwest or discount airlines. Mm -hmm. So capitalism provided discount travel for the poor and middle class, but the rich fly private jets. Mm -hmm. Today, the rich have their own rockets and their own satellites. So, do you know what I mean? Yes. Guys like Musk has Musk, yeah. Musk provides it. Uh, Branson, Branson has his own satellites and all this. So I'm going to have my own rocket ship. I just don't have it yet, mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of capitalism. Yeah. You know, for me to have my own rocket ship and launch my own satellite, I better be doing something. Yeah. Now, it's a stupid goal. I don't recommend it, but that's what capitalism is. Whereas socialism, let's take from the rich and give to the poor. Right. It's called Robin Hood theory. Mm -hmm. I don't support that because when I was in Sunday school, I was taught to teach people to fish, not take from the rich and give them fish. Right. And so that's where the, you know, we separate. It's sad to say. What do you think, uh, if you look into the future, this wealth gap that you're seeing that's starting to widen, where's this going to lead us? I think we're going to economic collapse, mm -hmm. personally, because for thousands of years, we've done what we've done thou for thousands of years, what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. We spend too much money, we print money, we debase our currency. You know, we, we, you know during the Roman empires, they took gold and silver and they mixed it with lead mm -hmm. and nickel mm -hmm. and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing. And so the trouble with what's happening to our money is in 1971 when Nixon took us off the gold standard, the dollar became debt. People don't know that. Dollar is debt. And they could print as much as they wanted. Mm -hmm. So the value of the dollar goes down. So if you're a rich dad, poor dad, I said savers are losers. Because mm -hmm. why would you save it when the Fed can print it? It, it doesn't compute in my capitalistic mind. The trouble is, historically, for thousands of years, anybody who's done this collapses. Mm -hmm. So the Roman Empire collapsed, the Chinese government collapsed, and we're doing the same thing. We just, we just don't live long enough to know it. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty close right now. Um, we just can't keep printing money and giving people money for free and, and think that it'll survive. And the trouble is, it's now a global problem you know, we have the central banks of like European, J Japanese, Chinese, everybody's central banks today, and we're printing money. It's not gonna last. This is a you know, somewhat uh, poignant statement, savers are losers, because they're saving dollars, or whatever their <laughs> currency is, and- That's and, all they know. Yeah, and it's all they know, and, and, and incidentally, it's, it's promulgated, right? You need to save, have zero debt, and you need to save, and that's the way you get to your future. And I have 100% debt and no savings. It's opposite. It's a parallel universe. Wow, but, but clearly, based on what is happening, you know, how money is debased, it's clearly, you know, you're, you're a lemming walking off a cliff. Yeah. And then you end up, you know, pretty broke, and you, you've got more life in front of you, uh, you know, that, and then what's going to happen is the, the, the communists are all going to scream more that we have to take from the rich and give to the poor. Correct. Scary scenario. And, and the rich are screwing everybody. It's not the rich, it's our education system screwing everybody. That's the problem. See, I'm a child of the 60s. Mm -hmm. I remember this quarter came up and had a copper tinge around it. I 1964. Yeah. That was debasing the money. Mm -hmm. And that's when savers became losers. Yeah. So I was at a trade uh, antique show and they were actually selling quarters for five bucks because the silver value was worth five dollars now. Wow. And so if you're a saver, you go, well, why is that quarter of five dollars now? Because your savings have gone down in value. No, they wouldn't do that to me. I said, yeah, they do every day. They print it.
Wow. They print money to pay their bills. You know, if you and I did that, we'd be in handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. No, I think that's really a, uh, a great analogy, saying, okay, here's a silver quarter. Five bucks. Give me, I get five bucks for that. Here's yeah. one of those ones with the copper rim. Yeah. It's 25 cents. Yeah. And that's the difference between saying we're, we have a monetary system that's based on something that's attached to like silver or gold as compared to saying, eh, we just can do what we want to the currency. It's got, it's got no reference point. And that makes it worth less and less every single day. Yeah. And, you know, everybody watches the stock market being a professional mm -hmm. investor. The problems of the bond market and the bond market is bigger than the stock market. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in serious trouble financially. And so that's why when I when I talk to people, I say buy. You know, buy a silver dollar. It costs you twenty bucks. Mm -hmm. oh, I can't afford twenty bucks. I said, then you got trouble. Yeah. Buy a dime for two dollars. Oh, I don't. I don't. I can't afford two dollars. It's the mindset screwed up. But yeah. they can go to McDonald's and buy a Big Mac. Yeah. And then hope that the consequences of the Big Mac uh, on their health is going to be paid for by the and, government. <laughs> and then they'll buy real estate with that Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and pay no taxes and use debt to buy it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that's why the rich really get richer. <laughs> and in a sense, you know, you say personally you pay no taxes, but you... Have I do it because I do what the government wants me to do. Exactly. And, and at the same time, though, you're causing, you know, through the jobs you create, many you know, workers to pay a bunch of tax. So Amen. there you have it, right? They, I mean, me. they, they, have to, they have to love you because uh, the, the people who are indoctrinated into the system who go to work for somebody else to pay their taxes every single day. Go to school, paycheck, get a job and pay your taxes, save money, get out of debt, and invest right? in the stock market. And if there's not somebody like you to orchestrate what needs to happen for those workforces to have a job, then there's no taxes that, that happen. So you're right. You're, you're heroic to the, the tax collectors because you create the jobs of the people that can be Pay taxed. taxes. Yes. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I, I got it. And it's the system. Uh, so what would happen if you did a thought experiment? What would happen if tomorrow morning the workers woke up to all this, kind of saw it for what it was? Suddenly, let's say that they can do a matrix download and, you know, and, and they suddenly say, oh, I just got the rich dad education you know, that I never got. Does that transform things in a positive way? What, what happens? Well, it's called, a, it's never, it'll never happen. You mm -hmm. know, like I said, there's four types of intelligence. It's yes. mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. And most people, when it comes to money, they're emotional as <laughs> hell. <laughs> they, they can't help but spend money. Yeah. They go to work to spend money. And the difference between, you know, the small entrepreneurs and big entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. My job as an entrepreneur is to create assets. That's all. So when I started, I started the Rich Dad Company, it's an asset. I never work there. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of money all the time from that. I buy real estate. I get money all the time. Then I buy oil wells. I have money all the time. And assets put money in your pocket. The reason the poor and middle class struggle is they buy liabilities they think are assets. Let me give you an example. You ask the average person, a house is an asset. Mm -hmm. Your house is a liability. Because it's not producing any income. Correct. It's taking money. Wow. And not only that, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and so what's the secret to it? It's a book on accounting. That's all it is. A simple book on accounting. And they never teach you accounting in school. Mm. Elaborate on that. So when you say it's a book on accounting. Income, expense, asset, liability, statement of cash flow. It's a Very simple stuff. Yeah. You can teach it to a kid but our schools will not teach it. I tried. Mm. I took it to Harvard and I got kicked out. <laughs> the European system of education produces two types of people, employees and soldiers, people who will do as they're told. Yeah. They cannot think. Chilling. And they're afraid of making mistakes. <laughs> and how do you learn if you don't make mistakes? How does a child learn to walk unless they fall down? Yeah. But in school you get punished for making mistakes. Stupid, 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 you made a mistake. And you sit there, you memorize this answer. A teacher who knows nothing about money tells you to memorize. In 1492, Columbus sailed a... Ocean blue. You're brainwashed. Yeah. And I got the only... The only I almost had 100 on my test one time. 
teacher asks, what, what was uh, Columbus's flagship? Mm -hmm. I asked the question, which voyage? I got hammered for that one. Wow. Well, because it was three voyages. Yeah. And the Santa Maria went, to, went aground on Hispaniola on the first voyage. Mm. You know, but the teacher didn't know that, so she just made me give me a uh, 99 instead of 100. I'm not that stupid, you know, mm -hmm. but I like history, that's why. Yeah. But I asked the question, which voyage? And then I challenged her, I said, well, Columbus never discovered America anyway. He made it to the Caribbean, he didn't make America. Ponce de Leon made it, you know. <laughs> but most teachers are just robots, they're parrots. They memorize and they give it, they're good people. My whole family is teachers. Mm. I love them dearly. I go home to Hawaii and my, this was years ago, my aunts would say, oh, they call me Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. Have you found a job yet? <laughs> <laughs> and I have to go, no, I don't have a job. <gasps> oh, I'm so sorry, too bad. Bad luck. I said, yeah, bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's, it's just a mindset. That's it's all a mindset. it is. And it's a reality. So now people are leaning in and saying, oh my goodness, I see what he's saying. Um, what should my next moves be? I, I, I have some, you know, excess capital, you know, beyond what my means to live with are, and maybe I'm per currently spending money on, on stupid things I don't need. What could my first step be toward trying to create some semblance of financial freedom for myself? Well, as I said, education is more important than before, but you're going to choose your education. Mm -hmm. And what educational, so... Well, it's, you know, I, I, you know I, would, I wouldn't go back to school personally. Right, right. And, you know, people say, do what you love. I say, invest in what you love. Mm -hmm. So there's four basic asset classes you can invest in. Number one is a business, mm -hmm. McDonald's, okay? Number two is real estate. Mm -hmm. Number three are papers, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and savings. Mm -hmm. Number four, commodities. Mm -hmm. I don't touch paper at all. I don't have stocks, bonds, mutual mm -hmm. funds, or savings. Mm -hmm because I can't control them. I can control my businesses, mm -hmm. I control my real estate, and I control my gold and oil. Mm -hmm. That's what I do, I'm a control freak. But most people don't have the skill set or that training to control their assets. So when, I, when people ask me what should I do, I said, well, what do you love? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I love real estate. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a real estate course. Oh, it takes money. I go, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any money. <laughs> I say, I also have no spiritual intelligence. And I was just about to say, so, and that's where, you know, the, the sense, if you can say out loud, that takes money, I don't have money. It's spiritual. almost like a, like a negative affirmation yep. that spiritually now you're, 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 you're poor, not broke, but poor as a mindset. You're spiritually poor. Yeah. Somebody took your heart and soul out of you, your willpower. Yeah, because the, the entrepreneur, so I say, if I lost it all today, I wake up tomorrow morning with my mind make it back. and my energy, and I can make it back. Right. And people, you know, I'm a Marine. I did horrible, I did horrible things in Vietnam as a pilot. And yet I wear this here. And this was a gift from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Mm. You know, so I'm not Buddhist or Christian. I just believe there's a spirit beyond all of this. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened for me in Vietnam. Marine Corps is a very spiritual organization. You know, we gave our lives so others could live. I'm alive today because dead men kept fighting. And we had to do horrible things, I mean, wrong. Yeah. But it's very spiritual. Most people don't have the spirit. They're, they're emotional, their emotions are so over, what if I fail, what if I don't have money? You know, going, then your spirit's been ripped out of you. Yeah. That's the sad part, you know? The, the doubt almost is like a poison right, to their soul. I mean, it's, it's like yeah. you know, this doubt of that, you know, what if this, these fears. Um, as Don't make mistakes. If you make mistakes, you're stupid. You gotta have money. Look, the reason, the reason I love real estate is I don't use my money. I use my bank's money. Mm. It's called debt. All I have to show the banker is how I'm gonna make money with the bank's money. That's all I have to do. And I, uh, what I said is good debt and bad debt. Mm -hmm. Most people have bad debt. Bad debt is debt you pay for, like mm -hmm. credit card debt, your mortgage, car payments. 
good debt is somebody else pays for you. So I have 6,700 apartments. Mm. That's 6,700 people paying my mortgage for me. <laughs> That's heaven. Kind of interesting thing, yeah. That, uh, you... And I pay no taxes. <gasps> <laughs> So I, I took a real estate course when I came back from Vietnam. It cost me 385 bucks. That, real, that $385 has made me a multimillionaire over and over and over again. Whereas my friends, when they got their MBA, they're still fearing, they're afraid of getting fired. It's to try to figure out how to pay for their student loan. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that, just tragic. And that's it? another thing, too, because you know, with you know, college education, how expensive it's got, because that's another big debt on the books, right? Student loans. That's not an accident, either. So talk to me about that. Well, what happened after the 2008 crash, there was, mm -hmm. I forgot the name of FFL or something like this. Mm -hmm. It came in in the 1950s, and it was to provide student loans for needy people. But what happened when the market crashed in 2007, 8, and 9, Obama had to cancel it because nobody wanted to lend money to students. Right. So Obama changed it, and it went to what we now know as the student loan debt. And the student loan debt that these kids, and so when you have student loan debt, colleges can charge more money. Mm -hmm. The trouble with the new loans that Obama put out, I'm not blaming him, mm -hmm. but those loans are the worst type of debt you can get. They're non-forgivable. Mm -hmm. you, if you don't pay off that student loan debt, it's an albatross around your neck forever. Mm -hmm. So the people that get screwed by that student loan debt our people either drop out of school and they have this debt, mm -hmm. or they don't make enough money to amortize the debt. So right after the subprime crash in 2008, that's when these new student loans came in in 2010. And that's why we have a problem today. But they don't tell the students that. And those schools are just sucking cash out of these poor students. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's horrible what they're doing to students. So we had subprime debt, and now we have subprime education, and you're still not learning anything about money. It's and criminal what it, we're doing. It really is, because they become enslaved, you know, because oh, yeah. of the debt. It's Somebody's like, going to pay that, you know, so I'm a banker, I'll lend mm -hmm. you the money. Thank you very much. You're going to pay me forever. Mm -hmm. Because you can't default on it. You cannot, bank, you, cannot, you cannot declare bankruptcy on student loan debt. Student loan debt is now the number one asset of the U.S. government. Really? Yes. Wow. We have, we have ripped off the youth of our country going to school, and the school teachers are clueless. So it's, you get this seduction as far as saying, you know, you need to go to school to yeah. be somebody. Mm -hmm. Then we'll lend you the money because we want you to go to school. And the schools then get greedy in a sense of saying, well, if they can borrow that much money, we can raise our tuition. It's so bad. Wow. Do you remember those... those there's a lot of schools today are, are, are diploma mills. Yes. Do you know what I mean? You go yeah. there and then they make it really easy and then you get your diploma and you're out, but they got your money. Mm -hmm. wow. And they're not competent students. I mean, I have a lot of employees, a lot of them are not ready for anything. So it's, it's kind of a mess we're in right now. So I sit there and that's why my little rich dad company chugs along and I, I love talking to guys like you. And, Say what I say, and then the teachers send me hate mail. <laughs> you mentioned a, a book by uh, M. Buck, Mr. Fuller, uh, that you read that had a massive impact on mm -hmm. you. Was, uh, was there more about him that, that influenced your thinking? Well, again, that seems like a parallel universe, because in 1967, I was in school in New York. I went to the Merch Marine Academy. Mm -hmm. And there was a thing called Expo 67 in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So my classmate and I hitchhiked to Montreal to see the geodesic dome that mm. Fuller built. And the geodesic dome by Fuller was the U.S. pavilion at the World's Fair. But I never met the guy there. And then years later, in the 1981, mm -hmm. he put on a seminar called The Future of Business. It was one week long. So I traveled from Hawaii to California to attend this one-week seminar with Dr. Fuller. And it blew my, he blew my brain away. It, went, it transformed me. I, I saw another world. So I think the spiritual side kicked in versus the mental side. And he had a, he had a saying, he says, you do not belong to you. You belong to the universe. Mm -hmm. Your true purpose may be forever obscured to you, but you may rest assured you're committing your life, you're committing your life to the highest, if 
you are, you are getting close to your life's purpose if you commit your life to the highest advantage of others. Mm. In other words, was I working for me or was I working for others? So that was 81. Did you feel like you found a purpose at that point? Like you got cool. It was time to work for others. Yeah. At the time, I was in rock and roll making a lot of money. You know, mm. I, was, I, had a, um, I was working for Duran Duran, The Police, Boy George, Van Halen, and What'd all you do that. For Sex, drugs, I don't, do, I don't do drugs, but a lot of sex and <laughs> rock and roll. <laughs> it was fun. And I was just making money. Yeah. And when Fuller says, you do not belong to you, you belong to the universe. Your true purpose may be forever obscured to you, but you may rest, rest assured your da 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 if you commit your life to the highest advantage of others. And so in 81, I had to ask myself, what do I know? What can I do? As Fuller says, I'm just a little guy. Yeah. So what can we all do as little people and we find our purpose when we want to help others. We don't, we don't find our purpose when we just want to make money. And that's what I was doing. So I said, what do I know? And that was 81, then 83, his book came out, Grunge of Giants. Mm -hmm. And it was about how the central banks of the world rip us all off. I knew that game. Wow. I grew up in it. I know it. Mm -hmm. So then I said, I'm going to have to start teaching. So my wife and I in 83, oh God, sad. I sold everything. My wife and I went hopeless just to teach. And we just kept teaching what we knew about money. And today we're multimillionaires, just kept going. So it's interesting that the purpose drove you and- uh, To teach. And to teach and-, and I hated school too. <laughs> is that amazing? Yeah. I mean, you know, the irony in it. And, but then the, you know, the outcome as far as, you know, Long term, you know, I guess it's kind of like, you know, uh, we make plans and God laughs, you know, it's like, you know, I want to accomplish this by this and this, this by this time. You just knew what you had to do based on something that moved you in your life. What, you know, was it I, I had no idea. Like it says, your, your true purpose may be forever obscure to you. Yeah. So what do I know? And what I knew was entrepreneurship, mm. what my rich dad taught me. And so my wife, Kim, and I left Hawaii, moved to California, we're homeless, and we just kept teaching. And, and as Fuller said, always and only in the nick of time, life support showed up. Mm. And magic happened. You know, next person that Kim and I met was John Denver and Bucky Fuller's daughter. And, you know, when people say, oh, how, how is it you spend time with Donald Trump? Why were you on Oprah? Mm. Why has all this magic happened to you? Because I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing what I know. I think I can do. What can I do? I'm a little guy. And that's what is lost, you know. I mean, I hate to say it, but so many times, like I've run into a lot of problems with my own, some of my own business partners. All they see me for is a chance to make more money. Mm. And it's a, you don't understand. If you focus on what you can do for others, God will take care of you. But you have to be smart, too. And you were with your wife, homeless, and money and relationships, you know, there's, there's a big relationship there as far right. as what happens when there's financial strain in, in a marriage. Did it bring you closer together? What, what happened for you in, in that period of time? Well, it wasn't easy, let me tell you. you know what I mean? So we, we were homeless for a long period of time. But I, I already had some basic skills. Mm -hmm. And then, so we made, I was an entrepreneur, I made money teaching and things like this. And, I just kept investing mm. in real estate. And we got richer and richer and richer, and I kept teaching again richer, and that's what happened. So uh, was it easy? No, it was mm. hell. But I made us stronger, spiritually stronger. You know, what they say, well, if it doesn't kill you, it may, well, you know, if it doesn't kill you, you get stronger. Unfortunately, too many young people today, they're so afraid of being hurt, mm. they get weaker. Yeah. So I'm not too opt optimistic. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them, you know. So we got stronger as a couple and richer and happier and stuff like that. Good stuff. But it's not been easy. Mm -hmm. we, got, we had people steal from us, partners rip us off, um, lawsuits. But you just get stronger. You know, don't retaliate, just get stronger spiritually. Don't retaliate, just get stronger. Yeah, get smarter and stronger. So 
then there is this very intimate connection between being an entrepreneur and your spirituality. Like, well, it depends on why you're an entrepreneur for us. Most people only want the money. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a million dollars and I'm going to retire. That's their only purpose. Mm -hmm. But my purpose, you know, I was in rock and roll. I was having a great time. Mm -hmm. My first date with my wife was to the police. Wow. And you know, I was backstage <clears throat> with the band and all that. It was really fun. Yeah. But once when Fuller touched me, he goes, he says, he asked me one day, is this, a, is this that week-long program, what's your life's purpose? And I said, to get rich. <laughs> and he scolded me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's a waste of a good mind. I said, well, maybe for you, but I like my money, you know. Mm. So I use my money, so I, I, learn, I use what I learned about money to teach others, and that's when my life changed. And this is uh, the thing that I think is very important. Many times people think, there's a, um, that material wealth and spiritual wealth are on opposite ends of a continuum. If you want to be more spiritually wealthy, you got to move away from material wealth. And if you want to be more material wealthy, you got to move away from spiritual wealth. But what you're proposing is that actually they can and should be one and the same. Yeah, it depends on you. It's called standard of living. I like my standard of sure. living. But I also write a lot about it. You know, people say live below your means. That's not my philosophy. Mm. Like, um, I've had four Ferraris now. Now, do I need four Ferraris? No. But every time I want a Ferrari, it's inspiration. So my wife says, so I say to my wife, I want a new Ferrari. She says, you know the process? The, the process is I gotta go find an asset that pays for the Ferrari. <laughs> that means that my assets pay for my liabilities. <laughs> and so every time I did that, I just gained more assets and I sold the Ferrari. I still had the asset. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Is that, like I wanted this Porsche one time, so I, I bought a mini storage, nothing down. The mini storage then bought the Porsche. I sold the Porsche, I sold the mini storage. <laughs> <laughs> That's mental, you know? Yeah. It's just education. Well, and, and it's in a sense, you, you used this term earlier, it's a model. Like you're talking about, you know, it's a business yeah. model, it's just another model of how you like to uh, you know, utilize liabilities that bring you pleasure. It's just a challenge, you know, I mean. Some people like to run triathlons. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a rugby player. I like, uh, you know, I'm not a soccer player. I'm a rugby player. I like hitting people. Why don't I play soccer? Because I can't hit people. <laughs> We're all different. That's all I'm saying, you know. Are you having fun? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. It's such a challenge every day. The biggest challenge is spiritually, emotionally, because you go up and down, up and down, up and down. And it gets harder to stay spiritual when you know people are stealing from you, robbing you, suing you. They're flooding them are friends, mm -hmm. and it's. How so, do you do it? So do you do you have any uh, any practices that you know help you stay spiritual in, in, yeah, in the face I of all that? Meditate. Mm -hmm. I seek uh, quote unquote therapy, you know, mm -hmm. to keep my mind straight because I'm a marine. Still in there, yeah. So I have to keep that little marine in, in check in here. And the marines ingrained that there's no such thing as an ex-marine. You could be a former marine, but you're you're still a marine. Yeah, yeah and it's one of the most spiritual organizations there is. Do you know what I mean? We're still so tightly bound. When we when I strapped in my helicopter, you know, taking off, we're we're five marines. We weren't lieutenant, corporal, and sergeant. You know, we're we're five marines, and we gave our lives so others could live. Mm -hmm. That is as spiritual as it get. And I came back from Vietnam, I got spit on. Yeah. You know, but it was still Vietnam was one of the best experiences of my life. I'm still friends with those guys. You know, it's a band of brothers. Yeah. That's spiritual. And I don't find that in business very often. No, unfortunately. Yep. Well you spent Many, many decades and your 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 own personal story is, is extraordinary and your you, know, you want to see the world a certain way, like, like you said, you, you certainly don't need to be sitting here talking to me right now, but you show up. And uh, there's, there's a reason for all that. Um, did you ever have sort of a summation on what the impact is you're, you're hoping that your purpose to help other people is? Like, you know, what, what do you want to see as a legacy? Well, as I said, you know, as Fuller taught me, he says, you do not belong to you, you belong to the universe. 
and what is and we're all sent here to do something we all have a special unique gift something that happened to us along the way and it's it's like from the bible not really religious either but you know there was a story of the master who had three servants and he gave each of the three servants different talents now the the switch in their talents is also money but talents are also gifts mm -hmm. So we're all given certain talents, not the same talents. And there was that one servant who did nothing, he wasted his talents. Another servant buried his talents. And the others multiplied his talents. Mm -hmm. That was a way of saying, give your talents. But most people don't do it, they work for money. Yeah. They want money becomes their master. And it's really silly, because you don't really need money to get rich. That's why I like real estate. <laughs> it's my banker's money. <laughs> and it's my tenant's money pay for my banker's money. Yeah, it's a good, it's a nice world. And I get tax breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the business of McDonald's. Yeah. My business is real estate. Well, you know, kind of in summing up, uh, one of the things that uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, wrote, which I, I, it spoke to me for some reason, I don't know if you have a comment or not, but and I'll paraphrase, I don't know if I remember it exactly, but I said something to the effect of, um, when I'm working on solving a problem, I have no thought of beauty. Right. But once I solve it, if there's no beauty, beauty in it, it, I know I don't have the right solution. That's it. That, that same uh, statement has haunted me forever. Why you know, so? I don't know why. I remember that because I studied with him three times. You know, I had the luxury of studying with him three times. But he always talked about, he says, when you look at a flower and you see this beauty, you look at a tree, you see its beauty. And if it's not beautiful, it's not correct, you know? And so that's, that statement has haunted me. Can I share with you what I think? Sure. Um, there's, you know, when I look at the branches of philosophy in sequence, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, the last one is aesthetics, yes. which is beauty. And if they're teaching philosophy for many, many years and thinking about you know, that sequence and how you use it as an applied philosophy, it, I had this inspirational thought. I don't think it was like not me thinking, but it just came to me, came to me. And it was that aesthetics, beauty, is really the first branch. That's where it all starts. And then it emerges from there. And then you, know, you look at a sunrise or a sunset, and no matter what, it's, it's always beautiful. It always moves you. Always it's, perfect. It's always perfect. Yeah. And I guess beauty and perfection you know, is maybe the universe's way to speak to us. Right. And so, you know, that the, you know, like a, uh, Eckhart Tolle, or I read his work, yeah. talks about the first flower. Yeah. I think about that a lot because sometimes we don't take the time to look at the flowers and the trees and the, how perfect everything is. I'm more kind of running the numbers in my head and things like that. Yeah. But I think that's the next evolution is for us going to that beauty and seeing the beauty instead of just trying to make more and more money. Yeah. That's a great vision. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. Really uh, a great you. honor to, to be with you and to speak to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Robert Kiyosaki sort of seems like an enigma, doesn't he? As much as he talks about the desire that he had from his youth to be wealthy, how he created the concept and wrote the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and all the work that he's done in his life, it seems like, well, he's all about the money. But what I also found out is that there's a spiritual side to his vision for why wealth should be created and how people can release themselves from the bonds of poverty and the bonds of confinement when it comes to their financial life. So I hope you took a lot of great notes and I hope you will watch this interview multiple times like I will. Well, I've got a real treat coming up for you here. The co-founder of The Motley Fool, David Gardner, who founded the company with his brother Tom, had created a brand that is known throughout the world in the arena of finances. These guys are smart, they're interesting, they're quoted all over the place, they've been out there for decades. And we went to their headquarters and had one great interaction with a lot of energy and amazing content with the co-founder, David Gardner. So enjoy this interview. David, thank you so much for inviting us into your home, or your home office, I sh should say, but it feels very friendly and homey here. Uh, looking That's kind for of you to say, Patrick. Yeah. I, thank you for suffering fools gladly. You have to really, <laughs> we're, we're like fools all the time. When actually anybody comes in from the outside world, hangs out with us, they're always raising the caliber here because you're